The Summer of the Beautiful White Horse by William Saroyan Narration by Kenneth De Silva One day, back there in the good old days, when I was nine, and the world was full of every imaginable kind of magnificence, and life was still a delightful and mysterious dream, my cousin Morad, who was considered crazy by everybody who knew him, except me, came to my house at four in the morning and woke me up, tapping on the window of my room. Aram, he said. I jumped out of bed and looked out of the window. I couldn't believe what I saw. It wasn't morning yet, but it was summer, and with daybreak not many minutes around the corner of the world, it is light enough for me to know I wasn't dreaming. My cousin Murad was sitting on a beautiful white horse. I stuck my head out of the window and rubbed my eyes. Yes, he said in Armenian. It's a horse. You're not dreaming. Make it quick if you want to ride. I knew my cousin Murad enjoyed being alive more than anybody else who had ever fallen into the world by mistake. But this was more than even I could believe. In the first place, my earliest memories had been memories of horses, and my first longings had been longings to ride. This was the wonderful part. In the second place, we were poor. This was the part that wouldn't permit me to believe what I saw. We were poor. We had no money. Our whole tribe was poverty-stricken. Every branch of the Garoglanian family was living in the most amazing and comical poverty in the world. Nobody could understand where we ever got money enough to keep us with food in our bellies, not even the old men of our family. Most important of all, though, we were famous for our honesty. We had been famous for our honesty for something like 11 centuries, even when we had been the wealthiest family in what we like to think was the world. We were proud first, honest next, and after that we believed in right and wrong. None of us would take advantage of anybody in the world, let alone steal. Consequently, even though I could see the horse, so magnificent, even though I could smell it, so lovely, even though I could hear it breathing, so exciting, I couldn't believe the horse had anything to do with my cousin Murad, or with me, or with any other member of our family, asleep or awake, because I knew my cousin Murad couldn't have bought the horse. And if he couldn't have bought it, he must have stolen it, and I refused to believe that he had stolen it. No member of the Garaglanian family could be a thief. I stared, first at my cousin, and then at the horse. There was a pious stillness and humour in each of them, which on the one hand delighted me, and on the other frightened me. Murad, I said, where did you steal this horse? Leap out the window, he said, if you want to ride. It was true then, he had stolen the horse. There was no question about it. He had come to invite me to ride, or not, as I chose. Well, it seemed to me that stealing a horse for a ride was not the same thing as stealing something else, such as money. For all I knew, maybe it wasn't stealing at all. If you were crazy about horses the way my cousin Murad and I were, it wasn't stealing. It wouldn't become stealing until we offered to sell the horse which, of course, I knew he would never do. Let me put on some clothes, I said. All right, he said, but hurry. I leaped into my clothes. I jumped down the yard from the window and leaped up onto the horse behind my cousin Murad. That year we lived at the edge of town on Walnut Avenue. Behind our house was the country. Vineyards, orchards, irrigation ditches, and country roads. In less than three minutes, we were on Olive Avenue, and then 
the horse began to trot. The air was new and lovely to breathe. The feel of the horse running was wonderful. My cousin Murad, who was considered one of the craziest members of our family, began to sing. I mean, he began to roar. Every family has a crazy streak in it somewhere, and my cousin Murad was considered the natural descendant of the crazy streak in our tribe. Before him was our uncle Khosrov, an enormous man with a powerful head of black hair and the largest moustache in the San Joaquin Valley. A man so furious in temper, so irritable, so impatient that he stopped anyone from talking by roaring. It is no harm, pay no attention to it. That was all. No matter what anybody happened to be talking about, once it was his own son, Arak, running eight blocks to the barber shop where his father was having his moustache trimmed to tell him that their house was on fire. This man, Khosrov, sat up in the chair and roared, It is no harm, pay no attention to it. The barber said, But the boy says that your house is on fire. So Khosrov roared, Enough! It is no harm, I say. My cousin Murad was considered the natural descendant of this man, although Murad's father was Zorab, who was practical and nothing else. That's how it was in our tribe. A man could be the father of his son's flesh, but that did not mean that he was also the father of his spirit. The distribution of the various kinds of spirit of our tribe had been, from the beginning, capricious and vagrant. We rode, and my cousin Murad sang. For all anybody knew, we were still in the old country where, at least according to some of our neighbours, we belonged. We let the horse run as long as it felt like running. At last, my cousin Murad said, Get down. I want to ride alone. Will you let me ride alone? I asked. That is up to the horse, my cousin said. Get down. Aha, uh -huh, the horse will let me ride, I said. We shall see, he said. Don't forget that I have a way with the horse. Well, I said, any way you have with the horse, I have also. For the sake of your safety, he said, let us hope so. Get down. All right, I said, but remember, you've got to let me try to ride alone. I got down and my cousin Murad kicked his heels into the horse and shouted, Vazir, run! The horse stood on its hind legs, snorted, and burst into furious speed. That was the loveliest thing I'd ever seen. My cousin Murad raced the horse across a field of dry grass to an irrigation ditch, crossed the ditch on the horse, and five minutes later returned, dripping wet. The sun was coming up. Now it's my turn to ride, I said. My cousin Murad got off the horse. Ride, he said. I leaped to the back of the horse and for a moment knew the most awful fear imaginable. The horse did not move. Kick into his muscles, my cousin Murad said. What are you waiting for? We've got to take him back before everybody in the world is up and about. I kicked into the muscles of the horse. Once again it reared and snorted. Then it began to run. I didn't know what to do. Instead of running across the field to the irrigation ditch, the horse ran down the road to the vineyard of Dikram Halabian, where it began to leap over vines. The horse leaped over seven vines before I fell. Then it continued running. My cousin Murad came running down the road. I'm not worried about you, he shouted. We've got to go get that horse. You go this way and I'll go this way. If you come upon the horse, be kindly. I'll be near. I continued down the road and my cousin, Murad, went across the field toward the irrigation ditch. It took him half an hour to find the horse and bring him back. All right, he said. Jump on. The whole world is awake now. What will we do? I said. Well, he said, 
We will either take him back or hide him until tomorrow morning. He didn't sound worried, and I knew he'd hide him and not take him back. Not for a while at any rate. Where will we hide him? I said. I know a place, he said. How long ago did you steal this horse? I said. It suddenly dawned on me that he had been taking these early morning rides for some time and had come for me this morning only because he knew how much I longed to ride. Who said anything about stealing a horse? he said. Anyhow, I said, how long ago did you begin riding every morning? Um, not until this morning, he said. Are you telling the truth? I said. Of course not, he said. But if we are found out, that's what you're supposed to say. I don't want both of us to be liars. All you know is that we started riding this morning. All right, I said. He walked the horse quietly to the barn of a deserted vineyard, which at the time had been the pride of a farmer named Fetvajian. There were some oats and dry alfalfa in the barn. We began walking home. It wasn't easy, he said, to get the horse to behave so nicely. At first, it wanted to run wild. But, as I've already told you, I have a way with the horse. I can get it to want to do anything I want to do. Horses understand me. How do you do it? I said. I have an understanding with the horse, he said. Yes, yes, but what sort of an understanding? I said. A simple and honest one, he said. Well, I said. I wish I knew how to reach an understanding like that with a horse. You are still a small boy, he said. When you get to be thirteen, you'll know how to do it. I went home and ate a hearty breakfast. That afternoon my uncle Kosrov came to our house for coffee and cigarettes. He sat in the parlour, sipping and smoking, and remembering the old country. Then another visitor arrived a farmer named John Byro, an Assyrian who, out of loneliness, had learned to speak Armenian. My mother brought the lonely visitor coffee and tobacco, and he rolled a cigarette and sipped and smoked. And then at last, sighing sadly, he said, My white horse, which was stolen last month, is still gone. I cannot understand it. My uncle Kosrov became very irritated and shouted, It's no harm. What is the loss of a horse? Haven't we all lost the homeland? What is this crying about for a horse? That may be all right for you, a city dweller to say, John Byro said. But what of my Surrey? What good is a Surrey without a horse? Pay no attention to it, my uncle Kosrov roared. I walked ten miles to get here, John Byro said. You have legs, my uncle Kosrov shouted. My left leg pains me, the farmer said. Pay no attention to it, my uncle Kosrov roared. That horse cost me sixty dollars, the farmer said. I spit on money, too, my uncle Kosrov said. <laughs> He got up and stalked out of the house, slamming the screen door. My mother explained. He has a gentle heart, she said. It is simply that he is homesick and such a large man. The farmer went away and I ran over to my cousin Murad's house. He was sitting under a peach tree, trying to repair the hurt wing of a young robin which could not fly. He was talking to the bird. What is it? he said. The farmer, John Byro, I said. He visited our house. He wants his horse. You have had it for a month. I want you to promise not to take it back until I learn to ride. It will take a year for you to learn how to ride, my cousin Murad said. Well, we could keep the horse for a year, I said. My cousin Murad leaped to his feet. 
What? he roared. Are you inviting a member of the Garoglanian family to steal? The horse must go back to its true owner. Okay, um, when? I said. In six months, at the latest, he said. He threw the bird into the air. The bird tried hard, almost fell twice, but at last flew away, high and straight. Early every morning, for two weeks, my cousin Murad and I took the horse out of the barn, of the deserted vineyard, where we are hiding it, and rode it. And every morning the horse, when it was my turn to ride alone, leaped over grape vines and small trees, and threw me and ran away. Nevertheless, I hoped in time to learn to ride the way my cousin Murad rode. One morning, on the way to Fetvajian's deserted vineyard, we ran into the farmer, John Byro, who was on his way to town. Let me do the talking, my cousin Murad said. I have a way with farmers. Good morning, John Byro, my cousin Murad said to the farmer. The farmer studied the horse eagerly. Good morning, son of my friends, he said. What is the name of your horse? My heart my cousin Murad said in Armenian. A lovely name, John Byro said, for a lovely horse. I could swear it is the horse that is stolen from me many weeks ago. May I look into its mouth? Of course, Murad said. The farmer looked into the mouth of the horse. Tooth for tooth, he said. I would swear it is my horse, if I didn't know your parents. The fame of your family for honesty is well known to me. Yet, the horse is the twin of my horse. A suspicious man would believe his eyes instead of his heart. Good day, my young friends. Good day, John Byro, my cousin Murad said. Early the following morning, we took the horse to John Byro's vineyard and put it in the barn. The dogs followed us around without making a sound. The dog. I whispered to my cousin Murad. I thought they would bark. They would, at somebody else, he said. I have a way with dogs. My cousin Murad put his arms around the horse, pressed his nose into the horse's nose, patted it, and then we went away. That afternoon, John Byro came to a house in his Surrey and showed my mother the horse that had been stolen and returned. I do not know what to think, he said. The horse is stronger than ever, better tempered too. I thank God. My uncle Kosrov, who was in the parlor, became irritated and shouted, Quiet, man, quiet. Your horse has been returned. Pay no attention to it. And that has been the Summer of the Beautiful White Horse. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you are listening to this via some online medium, kindly share it, subscribe it, and have a nice day.